Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on assurance, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. Are you saved? Have you ever been asked that question? This is a common question, and many people have discussed the pros and cons of it. Is it all right to know that you are saved today? What does the Bible teach on it? Here's a good text to begin with concerning the question of assurance, found in John, the fifth chapter, verse 24. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. How would you feel if the Lord Jesus himself came up to you and told you those words? Have you heard his word? Yes. Do you believe on him that sent me? Yes. Then you have everlasting life. You mean that if I died right now, I'd be in heaven when Jesus comes? Yes, you would. You mean that uh, I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm going to be eternally saved? No. The Bible talks about assurance, talks about full assurance. So let's really prize the good news of this topic for today, assurance of salvation. Now, this is based upon the great truth known as justification. Romans 5, verse 1, says it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification can be a heavy word, a big word, and uh, sometimes the theologians spend a lot of time discussing it, dissecting it. But I'd like to remind you that it simply is the Bible attempt, the theologians attempt, at reminding us that God's forgiveness is more than forgiveness. It's more than forgiveness. Well, how can that be? Let's look at it this way. If you steal from me, and then you make it right and ask me to forgive you, I forgive you, and you are now a forgiven thief. If you lie to me and uh, you uh, make it right and you ask me to forgive you for lying to me, I forgive you. Now you are a forgiven liar. But when God forgives you, it's different. You're not a forgiven thief or a forgiven liar. You stand before him as though you had never ever even lied or ever, ever even stolen. You're not a thief and you're not a liar and you never have been. In other words, justification based upon what Jesus did at the cross brings us the good news that we stand before God as though we had never, ever even sinned. Forgiven sinners, yes, but in a sense as though we had never, ever even sinned. You have to call that super forgiveness. That's why one Christian said it in an interesting way, and I've always liked it. He said, um, I come to God and I say, oh, God, I did it again. And he said, you did what again? You've never done it before. Oh, but some people get nervous with this kind of forgiveness. They say, you know, if I uh, stand before God as though I'd never ever sinned, then that can lead me to believe that I am entitled to uh, do it once and it'll give me freedom. Oh, please, how far can we twist our human logic and our minds out of shape? God's forgiveness, if we really believe it and understand it, leads to assurance and assurance leads us to such gratitude that we don't play fast and loose with God's grace. Not at all. It leads us to loyalty to our Redeemer. So we can say with confidence, 
If you've confessed your same sin to God a hundred times, that's 99 times too many. Because the first time you ask him to forgive you, he not only forgave you, but you stood before him as though you had never, ever even done it. No wonder justification by faith brings peace with God. Now, another text that is so good on this subject is 1 John 5, 11 and 12. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now notice the condition. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's simple, but it sounds a little complex because we, uh, at first glance, don't really find it easy to understand what it means to have the Son. You know, how can you have someone you can't see? What does it mean to have them anyway? And then on second uh, look, we realize that we use the same kind of language today. When I say I have a wife, or you have a husband, or they have a friend, what do we mean? We mean they have a relationship with that person. They are in communion, communication, fellowship with that person. That's what we mean. So when we read in 1 John, he that hath the Son hath life, then we know that if we have a relationship with God today, we have life today. What kind of life? Eternal life. It comes with Jesus. You mean that I'm saved today? Yes, I'm saved today. Is it all right to be saved today? Yes, it's all right to be saved today. Oh, but isn't, isn't it dangerous to say we're saved? Yes, it's dangerous if we have the idea that because we're saved today we can never be lost that's dangerous it would be dangerous if it caused us to sit back and relax and not to worry about the fight of faith anymore or reading the bible or praying or spending time with god but the bible is very clear that we should have the assurance today that we are saved today that's why i like the uh answer that someone gave when another person came up with the usual question, are you saved? And they said, so far, so far. Uh, one time I was invited to go to some uh, public meetings by the Nazarene preachers. They were having a week of special devotion. So I went to listen and the Nazarene evangelist stood up and said, we believe in once saved, always saved, as long as you keep saved. And that was good. I believe that way too. I believe the same thing when it comes to marriage. I believe in once married, always married, as long as you stay married. How's that? Well, what does it mean to stay married? How do you stay married? The same way that you became married in the first place, by communication. In fact, that's the key word for all happy homes. I've done a lot of studying to, fi to find out what the secret is of uh, happy or unsuccessful marriages, and it's always the same. Communication or breakdown of communication, always the same. So if you have communication with God and continue that communication with Him day by day, you are saved day by day, and you can join people like Francis of Assisi, who was hoeing his garden. And someone came by and said, what would you do if you knew that you would die tonight? He said, I would finish hoeing my garden. That's peace. That's assurance. Now, there's a practical reason why this kind of peace is so important. It brings victory. Notice how this works. Peace brings victory. Victory doesn't bring peace. It is peace that brings victory. One day I was reading a little book called Steps to Christ. It's a beautiful book on the Christian life. And I came to page 49, I think it was, and it began 
the chapter on forgiveness by telling about a messed up life, confused and failing life. It talked about the person who is overcome with guilt and remorse and has no peace, the one who falls and fails and sins and is tempted to believe that God doesn't love them and doesn't accept them. And then it says, here's the answer. And I thought, what is the answer? The answer must be trying harder or praying more or making more resolutions. No, it says the answer for the confused and failing life is peace. Peace? How can you have peace when you have nothing but failure in your life? I began to ponder it, began to listen and watch. And I discovered to my surprise that victory comes from peace. Most people are trying to get peace by getting victory. And they feel if they can get their act together, then they'll be peaceful and happy. No. It is becoming peaceful and happy that brings our act together, that gives us victory. Let's look at it this way. Here's a typical person who falls and fails and sins. And uh, they feel that they must be punished. Often religious people feel they must be punished for their failures and for their sins. Well, uh, many of their sins might be unknown to others, and so uh, they have to punish themselves. And uh, a good way to punish themselves is to do the same thing again. Because if I do the same sin again, I'll feel worse. And making myself feel worse is a convenient form of self-punishment. So uh, the behavioral science people, the psychologists, they tell us that this is the very reason why many people will continue to fall and fail all the time, habitual falling and failure, because they feel that this must be punished and they keep punishing themselves. And they hope to find peace in that way. Martin Luther tried it before he understood the great news of justification by faith. He beat himself senseless in the monastery cell. And the monk came by and said, Martin, Martin, you cannot atone for your soul by afflicting your body. Many are the ways that people have struggled for peace. Then we come along and we discover that Jesus already died for our sins. If anyone needed to be punished, Jesus took our punishment. We don't have to punish ourselves. Sin has already been handled in the great plan of salvation. And we can have peace. And when we discover that we have peace and we don't have to punish ourselves, then we don't have to keep doing the same things again. And that brings victory. That's the way it works. It even has good psychological sense to it. Peace brings victory. Stop trying to get peace by getting victory, neighbor. Understand it the other way around, God's way. We get victory by, first of all, finding peace. Then we go through the book of John. John was the disciple that it says Jesus loved. And I used to think that uh, John was sort of an egomaniac because he's the one that said it in his book, referring to himself, the disciple that Jesus loved. Until one day I discovered the original Greek meaning of that word. And what he was really saying was that he was the disciple that Jesus kept on loving, in spite of it all, in spite of him, kept on loving. Well, what does he say? He says something that came out of his own experience a reflection of his own study and his own observation of Jesus and his kindness. Again and again, he says it. We already have life. We already have life. He that believeth on me hath eternal life. John 6, 47. Those who eat of the bread that came down from heaven will never die. John 6, verse 50. And John 11, verse 26 that verse that follows right after the famous resurrection text. He that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. 
shall never die. Do you live? Yes. Do you believe on Jesus? Do you trust in him? Yes. Then you'll never die. Did you know that? You'll never die. This is taken from that famous passage of scripture about Lazarus. John 11:25 said it. It's on the tomb of George Washington. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. But the story that precedes that text is amazing. Lazarus had died, the way we say it. And four days had gone by. During that time, Jesus had gotten the message about his sickness. And he had sent word back, this sickness is not unto death. Not unto death. They reminded Lazarus that he wasn't going to die. The master said so. The sickness is not unto death. I love to go to the bedside of people today. I like to read John 11. Someone who has a terminal illness, we call it. I like to tell them, this sickness is not unto death. What do you mean? You're not going to die. My Bible says so. Why? Because you have everlasting life. You have eternal life now. I do now? You mean I'm not going to get it then? No, you have it now. It's present tense. We might sleep. We might sleep. But we'll never die. Jesus didn't like to use the word death. He preferred the word sleep. And that's why I like that poem that the voice of prophecy speaker loves to quote. How the changing years have found me, far away from thoughts of home. Now no mother bends above me when the time for sleep has come. But it brings my poor heart comfort and it gives me peace within just to think that I am little and my mother tucks me in. As I kneel there with my brother by the bed above the stairs and I hear my gentle mother saying, boys, remember prayers. Then she comes and kneels beside us. Father, keep them from all sin. Oh, her kiss is tender, gentle, when my mother tucks me in. When at last the evening finds me and the day of life is done, all the things of earth that bind me shall be broken one by one. Then, O oh Lord, be thou my comfort. Calm my soul, thy peace to win. Let me fall asleep as gently as when mother tucked me in. Just last month, we laid my father to rest. And I'll never forget how wonderful these words sounded as I stood there by that open grave. He's not dead. He's only sleeping. Soon there'll be the resurrection morning, and the golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come to take his faithful and happy children to their promised home. But we have the assurance of all of that right now, right now. We can talk with full assurance. And this kind of peace and this kind of assurance not only gives us victory, it gives us hope and is an anchor to the soul, the Bible says. Remember long ago when Jesus was here, in Matthew the ninth chapter, it tells about a group of four men that came bringing a, a sick man to Christ. He was a paralytic and he was a sinner. Apparently he was a real sinner. Not just the kind that is born into a sinful world. He had done his share of sinning. And some of those who comment on the Bible are quite sure that his was a social disease that had taken him to his very last moments. He was wasted, he could not walk, he was an invalid. He was on his deathbed, but he found these four friends who were willing to take him to Jesus. So they went to see Jesus there in Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. Now there was a house there, Peter's house, 
which uh, was so crowded with people that there's no way they could, they could get in. They tried, but they could not press their way through the crowd. The Bible speaks of that, that often people who wanted to see Jesus could not see him because of the press, for the press. So these four friends, at the sick man's suggestion, crawled up on the roof and opened up the roof over Jesus' head, uncovered the roof and let him down right in front of Jesus on these four ropes. So suddenly as Jesus is talking to the crowds of people, this poor sick man comes down before him. Watch him as he looks into the eyes of Jesus and look into the very depths of his soul because there's one thing that this man wanted more than anything else. It was not health. It was not healing. It was peace. He was looking for peace. He was looking for assurance. And Jesus knew that. The Holy Spirit revealed to Jesus what people were thinking. He helped them understand their minds, their thoughts, their deeper desires. So he looked at the man and he said, uh, friend, and one of the gospel writers says that Jesus said to him, my friend, my friend. You mean the one who is God calls a man like this his friend? Yes, my friend. Your sins be forgiven. That was what the sick man wanted to hear. That's not what the rabbis and the scribes and the spy ring from Jerusalem wanted to hear. They made the most out of that and criticized him for blasphemy because they didn't believe he was God and they didn't believe he could forgive sins. But that's what the sick man wanted to hear. And we understand that he laid back on the cot in perfect peace, willing to die or live whatever was God's will but perfect peace. However, something else happened that's hard to explain. It can only be explained by one who experiences it. When Jesus gave him peace and told him his sins were forgiven, the sick man was also healed. Healing comes with peace. And he had the power to walk again. Jesus knew it. So you recall what he said to the scribes and Pharisees and the critics. He said uh, that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And the sick man did the same thing that the dust did when God created man in the first place. It jumped to attention. And if even the dust will jump to attention, why not a poor sick man with a mind to think? And he jumped to his feet and he took the mat on which he had been let down through the roof. And it says he went out before them all. He couldn't get in without coming through the roof, but he didn't go back through the roof. He went out before them all. They couldn't find space to let a sinner in to see Jesus, but they found space to let him out. They were in awe Watch them as they fall back. And the lame man carries his bed like it's a feather and goes down that aisle that they made for him and straight home where his family and friends are surprised. They hardly recognize him, but he's different now. This story simply demonstrates a great truth that people who have assurance and people who have peace People who have been forgiven can walk. They can walk. And the Bible tells us that we ought to walk even as Jesus walked. Is it talking about walking down the street or down the dusty road of Galilee? No, it's talking about walking in his footsteps in terms of life and obedience and power. People who are forgiven, people who have assurance, people who have peace, are able to walk because peace brings release, peace brings victory, peace brings power. 
It may be that one reason you don't find victory over your sins is you don't really believe you're forgiven. Because when you do believe you're forgiven and have assurance of eternal life, you will have victory. Peace is sure to lead you there. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can be justified by faith and have peace with God. We pray that you'll help everyone today who listens to know that kind of peace and to clasp to their hearts the good news of the gospel. Thank you for making it possible and that you're not in the business of trying to see how many people you can keep out of heaven. You're trying to see how many you can get in. Accept our thanks, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. <laughs>